Good morning, good morning. Welcome to the replay. If you're joining the replay, hit that like button and leave a comment below. And you know, if you like memory training, ideas about using memory palaces, how to make uh, your process of learning a lot faster and clearer so you remember more, then you definitely want to be subscribed to this channel if you aren't already. And let's talk about Thor. Thor is, you know, a cool movie series. It's not just one uh, movie, so there's a lot of potential for using Thor as a source of memory palaces. If you want to get into what I call virtual memory palaces, by the way, if you're hopping on, hit that thumbs button and uh, let me know where in the world you are, what you're doing, what you're thinking, and if you've seen Thor or not, and uh, get out a hammer and hit something. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but. Uh, it's a, a really cool movie, there's a lot to be said about it, and there are three memory palaces that I created out of it. And so, why make movies into memory palaces, and you know, why use movies as part of memory practice in general? And there's a real solid reason why, and that is really beginning with the fact that you can get very good passive memory practice out of any movie that you watch. So it doesn't have to be Thor, although sci-fi movies tend to be really, really interesting because you need to think about locations that have less reference to real places in the world, and that exercises your imagination more. So what is passive memory exercise, first and foremost, before we get into this idea of creating memory palaces from movies? Passive memory exercise is really well established as a very, very powerful way of strengthening your memory, making it strong and uh, unbreakable. And the reason why that it works is because you're not using memory techniques in, in the case of passive memory. What you're doing is you're just asking your memory to do some work in a way that is passive because it's not an active process of remembering as such. So what you do is you just ask yourself questions in the case of movies like what was the opening scene? And then you just let your memory bring back whatever it remembers. You're not using any sort of technique to have memorized that scene. You just ask your memory. Now you can be a little bit more active about it and so the source or one of the sources of this exercise is called the um, the four details exercise. So it's usually used with people, and so you see people in the world, and you'll notice four details about them consciously, and then later in the day, like an hour later, maybe five hours later, then at the end of the day, you'll actively try to recall what those four details are. So shoes, hair color, eye color, whatever, some, some set of details. And that's a great exercise and it really does work. We know that it works. There's tests all around it and so forth and uh, it really will strengthen your memory. But you did do something active, which is that you actively chose to pay attention to the details of people. When it comes to movies and so forth, you can just not even actively choose to pay attention to the details in order to get this truly passive memory exercise because the only active part is saying, well, what was that opening scene? And you'll find that that can be a, an interesting challenge because you think, well, I saw it, but really, what was that opening scene? And you can actually get more granular, more detailed. Instead of just saying, what is that opening scene? You can also say, what exactly was the first shot? So I want to get to uh, some of the comments too. And by the way, if you're here, let me know where you are in the world. And who you are and what you're thinking. Happy Pratt is here, greetings from the UK. Saw Thor last night, loved it. Quite what 80s retro has to do with Norse gods is a bit beyond me, but you know funsies. <laughs> yeah, it is fun, for sure. Thank you for that. And um, thank you for letting me know where you are uh, and that you saw the movie because, yeah, that that is an interesting thing, but that's the power of the movie, right? We don't know what the connection is between North mythology, Norse mythology and retro of not just any one decade, but actually there's multiple decades being referred to. But think of all the connections to comics as another medium. Think of the choice of, you know, Jeff Goldblum, for example. And then what that brings up, 
you know, one of the reasons why he's not blue in the movie is because he had played a blue character in a movie before that. This is a way of starting to generate stronger neural pathways, accessing memory, things that you know about cinema, about pop culture and so forth. And a lot of people will say, well, pop culture is junk and it's uh, brain candy that rots your brain and so forth. But that really depends on how you use it. So yeah, you can have a lot of ideological junk that goes on in these movies that smash your head with a hammer. <laughs> but uh, you can also have a lot of powerful memory exercise and just general intellectual exercise by using these movies as a jumping off point, a leaping off point for making connections. So I, I'm really grateful that you raised that point because actually that is the most powerful thing. We don't know why those connections are there, but they are there and we can make them. So that's another form of mental exercise that comes from the movies. And speaking of connections, here is the memory connection, which goes into a lot more detail about that. And if you're interested in details about how to get the memory connection, then go to, got a little old school retro <laughs> way of putting this up there, magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash connect. So anyway, the passive memory exercise is really, really powerful, and it's a great way of keeping your brain healthy. It's kind of like juggling in your mind. I've got my Think Buzan juggling balls here. I've been studying juggling, actually, and uh, it's really fun getting, getting quite far with it, actually. I can recite almost the entire alphabet backwards while juggling, so <laughs> that's, that's a really cool, uh, fun thing, and uh, making some video document about that to, uh, to patch something together later to show the process of how that, that developed. Um, learning uh, multiple skills at once. Well, I already, already know how to uh, say the alphabet backwards, but uh, not how to juggle and not how to juggle while saying, saying the alphabet backwards. The next thing would be to juggle hammers while saying the alphabet backwards. Anyway, passive memory exercise, very, very powerful. So you can use four details on people, you can use four details on cars, or you can use maybe four things that you want to remember about a movie that you've seen. That could be four character names, it could be four names of locations, it could be um, four colors that really stood out to you in the color schemes, could be the names of actors, you could try to actively memorize names of production crew at the end, and if you keep it small, just four, then well, you know, that's, that's better than nothing, and you can actually use real memory techniques if you want, but that would be more active. So anyway, one of the things that I like to do, and it's a great mental exercise, it stimulates creativity, really, really keeps the brain hopping, and gets the most out of your memory-going experience. Like, instead of just having fun, which is great, you can also get brain exercise out of it that doubles the fun, triples the fun, if not even quadruples it or more, by replaying as much of the movie in your mind as you can and really thinking about that experience and reconstructing as much as you can and, and experiencing it internally and then really paying attention to and analyzing what your experience is. Because the more you know about how your mind and your imagination work and without judging it, without thinking, oh, that's a real struggle, but just taking it for what it is and analyzing it and understanding it and then thinking about what's going on. The more tools you'll have when you're using memory techniques, when you're using mnemonics, when you're using memory palaces, you'll understand so much better about how you quote unquote see in your mind. And you know, a lot of people, the whole aphantasia, aphantasia thing, people just, you know, really struggle with not having a mind's eye, but you do have a mind's eye. It just may not necessarily use images in the way that you think. So I can think of Thor, for example, and I hear a lot. I hear Hulk's voice. I hear um, Thor's voice, and that's really two distinct sounds, and they are, in memory science, called mental images, whether you see them or not. And then you can think, well, what happens when I take that sound, and then I start to try and remember what Thor looked like, before his haircut and after his haircut, and then think about, ooh, now that haircut, who was it that gave him that haircut? Which, as you, oh, I'm not gonna give it away if you haven't seen the movie. Go see the movie. But there's an interesting point of connection there, a way of developing the memory connection for yourself that will help make everything much more magnetic and 
that is actually, that scene where the haircut takes place is a great memory palace. A great, great memory palace. I want to check in with the comments here that are coming in. Happy Pratt says, I learned to juggle in an afternoon with apples. By the time they were mush, I could do it. Yeah, well, put a little, <laughs> put a little skin in the game and maybe you will speed things up, like uh, maybe some valuable diamonds or jewelry or something. That might help speed up the process, but apples, yeah, that's a pretty, pretty interesting idea. Um, wondering if maybe watching trailers after you've seen a film and use parts like you suggest might bring it back to mind and help solidify it. Yeah, that's actually an interesting question. Thanks for that. Anything that you can do to compound what you want to learn or what you want to remember better will do that. So adding additional material will certainly do that. That's why I always tell people, you know, one, when you're studying memory, one is the most dangerous number. So I think The Memory Connection is a great book that you really ought to have. But what it will tell you in there is don't make it your only book. Keep studying memory. Keep adding to the pool. And uh, if you don't have The Memory Connection, go to magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash connect for information about getting it, and it will help you find new books to add. Constantly add new books. I mean, I'm reading all the time additional books and uh, they're for different topics. I read at least one memory book a month. One of the great things that you get with the memory connection is adding on uh, through the magnetic seal of approval program more memory books in live video webinar discussions that people who have the memory connection are able to join. And uh, wow, it's just amazing the things that come out when you have essentially a book club that you you belong to to compound more information so if you want to compound your memory of a movie then yes watching trailers afterwards will certainly help with that and I think it'll also if you actively choose for it to do so it'll help attenuate your mind or prime your mind for being more of a cinephile so to speak and think of things like who directed this movie what studio does it come from what's the music like is the music that was in the trailer actually in the movie? And actually, it's really interesting that you mentioned that. When I was doing film studies and working on my PhD, I was able to see the Michael Mann movie of uh, Miami Vice in New York at an advanced screening. And I'll tell you, that was one of the most amazing experiences because we'd seen the trailer and then we saw the advanced screening and it was well, it wasn't an advanced screening, it was a test screening. And it was really, really wild, a really different experience because then we went and saw it when it was released and they made changes. They made changes based on the studio or the audience response. And some of the music was different and I, which is just really interesting uh, experience. So I don't know if you've ever been to an, uh, a test screening, but if you ever have a chance to do it and then go see the final product, it's really wild. and. Uh, the differences can be astounding. So that uh, covers that, basically in terms of establishing a means of using movies to get more value out of them and memory exercise, passive memory exercise anyway, and then making sure that you are fit for compounding that value if you just want to enjoy cinema better, then go and watch the trailer after you've seen the movie and think about it at a deeper level. Because cinema is a, a fascinating tool for just understanding the world better, period. And then that makes, that gives you more memory tools. So I mentioned Jeff Goldblum, why he's not blue in Thor, right? Well, why do I know this? And why is this important? Well, it's because he was blue in a movie previous to this, right? It opens up your enjoyment of cinema and then you can go back and watch that previous movie or watch the trailer of it and really, really engage and light up parts of your brain that are just sitting there dying for attention. They're dying for exercise. Your cells really, really want this. Uh, in case you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm practicing a new shuffle here because <laughs> uh, I'm a fidgety person and I like to uh, keep my hands busy. And I'm not going to juggle on, uh, <laughs> on YouTube yet, although I am documenting my learning process with the goal of not being to juggle. I can juggle now pretty good. It doesn't take that long, actually. It's shocking how short of a period of time that it comes to. And of course, I'm building up to hammers so I can have Thor-like strength um, and be Mr. Strong. But uh, the thing is that, uh, you know, 
anything that you can do to figure out who you are and what you're like and occupy your hands if you need to, then just do it. Don't uh, let being fidgety stop you from anything. Multitask. Multitasking gets a bad name sometimes, I think. By the way, if you're hopping on the call and you haven't said hello yet, let me know where you are. And if you're watching the replay, then uh, let me know who you are and where you are anyway, down in the comments. And uh, hit that thumbs up, let me know you're engaged. We're gonna check in with our comments here and see what are your thoughts on using memory as a, or music as a memory aid, like getting the soundtrack of a film, of the film. Oh yeah, absolutely. So I was talking about this passive memory exercise, seeing a movie, then later in the day, replaying it in your mind thinking about different scenes, how many scenes you can recall, how many in order, you might want to get out like a memory journal and a dr write out a summary, which is a great way of giving yourself additional connection because connection happens through activity, through processing. You have multiple modes of processing, verbal, uh, written, actually auditory input. So the suggestion to go back uh, from Pratt if I remember your name correctly here, let me just do a little chest test. Yeah, happy brat. Um, if you go back and, uh, and process it again with sound, add that sound through a soundtrack, then you're able to do this. And I'll tell you a little story. <laughs> I still kind of stand, can't really believe that we used to do this. But my brother and I, we loved movies a lot. And so what we would do, and back, back when I was a kid, you know, you had to go and rent a VCR and bring it home and rent the movies. And to maximize the value of that excursion, we would carry from Movie Mart the, a massive VCR over our shoulders in these padded bags that they would have, and they would have a, a, a component, a container, where you could put in maximum two videos. Oh, Common Sense is here from California. Hello, Common Sense, thanks for saying hello. Um, two videos in these things, because then you'd have all the cables in there and everything. and. <laughs> We would drag this movie home, and to maximize the value, what we would do is we would put on a cassette, and we would record the soundtrack of the movie, and we would then listen to it on our Walkmans, so we could revisit the movie as many times as we want after we had to bring it back. Because back then, you had 24 hours to rent a movie, and you had to bring it back along with the VCR, because we didn't own a VCR. And so, I don't know, man, I remember dragging these things through the snow. <laughs> <laughs> and then watching these movies two at a time and we would record the soundtracks and then in our Walkman I remember taking the VCR back listening to the soundtrack in my Walkman of the very movie that we had rented and bringing back and one of my favorite ones that I listened to you know I don't want to exaggerate it but I'm sure I listened to it a couple dozen times I listened to Robocop again and again and again and again so it wasn't just the soundtrack of the music but also the entire movie but back to Happy Pratt's question, also you can just take the, the actual soundtrack and play it. So one of my favorite soundtracks is Howard Shore's score for Existence by David Cronenberg. And I love to listen to those things and listen to the pieces. They're usually about three minutes on the, on the soundtrack, three to four minutes. And I love to just replay the images from the movie in the mind, but not just the images, but the scenes, the places, and think about them spatially, reconstruct them spatially in my mind, and play with, play with what is essentially spatial memory of places you've never been, but build it out. It's really a lot of fun. Um, Happy Press is resourceful. Yeah, it was resourceful, but you know, back then, you just, the idea of owning a VCR was really for the super rich, and it just wasn't, uh, on our radar. Uh, common sense, I see your question there about memorizing Bible verses. We'll get to that. Uh, that's an interesting one. Um, but thank you, Happy Pratt, for asking these questions because they really make me realize that I've never used Movie Mart as a memory palace. And there's, there's an opportunity there. And also my dentist was there. The Bank of Montreal was there. Maybe it still is. There was a butcher there. A, or, yeah, and a, a bakery and Safeway was there, and there was a flower shop, and I believe there was actually a Bible uh, a, a supply store, or I'm not sure what you would call it, but where, where literature uh, around, from, uh, from related to the Bible was available, and that was also where we bought our, our Christian heavy metal, so bands like Tourniquet, for example. Some people pronounce that tourniquet. 
and uh, oh good good to see some questions coming in I'll be getting to these uh, if you're just joining us thumbs up and let me know where in the world you are and so forth and we're talking about building memory connections memory palaces from movies Thor in particular I think was a good one using it as a passive memory exercise replaying movies in your mind to help develop different levels of memory and association and uh, I really appreciate all these great questions because they they're really what makes this grow so thank you for that um, checking in here let's see so common sense let me know what memorizing Bible verses activities you've done so far have you created a memory palace what is a verse that would really really create a great feeling of accomplishment for you if you had it in memory and pop it in pop that exact verse in here and if it uh, if it uh, is a verse that relates to Thor, if it has a hammer involved, all the better. That will help us be strong. Uh, okay, so let's see. Nick says, I used to, thanks for being here, Nick, and for saying hello. I used to record lectures at uni. The best way to prep for exam, no soundtrack though, just some dude or lady walking from one speaker to another when you are listening in the headphones. Yeah, I used to record university lectures a lot as well, and you know, I would listen to music as on top of that. Actually, we're, I'm working now on the, the uh, December Magnetic Memory Method newsletter and talking about combining soundtracks with, with um, recorded things like that. The question is, does adding music, a layer of music, make it more engaging or distracting? It depends on the nature of the message, I find. Um, but that's an interesting thing. But I used to li re-listen to a lot of lectures. And, you know, it's, it's just another way of processing the information and it relieves the mind of needing to really pay attention and and put all your stakes in your notes right you you take notes differently and more freely when you know you have a backup recording and I suggest that that's the case and you'd find it in your own experience it was certainly my experience that you take notes differently even if you never listen to that backup recording because there's something more free. And so you're not in a scarcity mode, writing down all this stuff, not paying attention to what's actually coming in because you're still stuck on what came two minutes ago, you know, trying to get it all out and make these connections. But if you have a background, uh, sorry, a, um, a backup recording, you're gonna have a much, much freer experience sitting there. And it's the same thing with the movies. You know, the notes that I take while I'm watching movies for film analysis and so forth. They're much more abstract, free, little drawings and so forth, and, and I do what it's essentially amounts to blind contour drawings because I'm not looking at the drawing, and it doesn't really matter if I'm able to read my notes or not because the movie can be watched again and should be watched again. Um, and it, it, it's, it's, it's just super powerful to free your mind. So Nick's asking, what do I think about the Robocop remake? You know, even though I really like the actor that they chose, I think he's a phenomenal actor. I couldn't get through the first 15 minutes of the remake. I just thought, this is just not good cinema. Now, I might be able to revisit it again because I, as a general rule of thumb, what doesn't work on Tuesday sometimes does work on Wednesday. And, uh, and I might enjoy it, but I just thought, this is just wrong. Uh, there's something really wrong about what they're doing here. There's no vision to it. it, it it wasn't, it just didn't capture me. So that could be my fault, their fault, the fault of no one, just a timing thing. But I didn't, I didn't find it enrapturing the way that Verhoeven's Robocop grabs you by the throat and you just can't stop watching. Because it, you know what the thing is with the original Robocop that's so profound. And again, I guess it's in, I guess it's in the remake but it does it from an angle that I, just, I personally don't connect to, but it opens a world. It opens a world that, is, that tells you the world is changing and is in flux, and the stakes are really, really high, but in a way that's humorous, in a way that you know is a bit tongue-in-cheek and that much more serious as a result of being so tongue-in-cheek because irony and black humor 
it almost borders on uh, it almost borders on satire. And one of the things that satire requires is that it teaches you the rules of how that world works. And it does it so fast in Robocop. But in the remake, as it opens, as I recall how it opens, there's no tongue-in-cheek humor. There's no satire. There's no irony. It's not really telling you the rules of how the world works with that, with that Verhoeven flair or touch that just draws you in and sets the rules of the game. Now, to be fair, I didn't watch the whole of the remake, so maybe all that is triggered later. I also wasn't eight years old. Or whatever. <laughs> so my imagination, you know, the neurons in my brain were firing at a much different pace. So maybe eight-year-olds would, if I was eight and watched the remake, would love, uh, would love that. Uh, Nick says, would recommend removing, mo removing a bit of mid-frequencies from the soundtrack when you are mixing music and voice. Yeah, I, I can see that. So no elevator music then. You know, if elevator music makes for a more pleasant ride, I guess so. I've never really actually experienced elevator music, to tell you the truth. It's a cliche in movies and commercials, but I can't distinctly recall ever hearing elevator music anywhere. No, no memory palaces to be made come to mind, uh, although it must be. I know that washroom music comes to mind, especially when I lived in New York, but uh, in any case, yeah, no elevator music. <laughs> Happy Press says, re-listening to lectures would also be reassur would be so reassuring. You already have an overview, then you can concentrate on selections. Yeah, select selections. Yeah, I like that. This is true because you're priming the mind. It's it, it, it comes down to the difference between speed reading and slow reading. And one of the things that's really good in speed reading is that, or many speed reading trainings, is it teaches you how to prime your mind for the book as a whole. But at the end of the day, if you really, really want to get a good sense of a book, read it from cover to cover. But read it from cover to cover in different ways. So, you know, I, I'm uh, reading a book now, and the first thing was to go through it. Examine the book as an object, front to back, and so forth. And uh, go through the title, uh, the chapter, table of contents. Go through the index, look at those books, get a sense of what's being referred to there. Um, go through the recommended resources, go through all of what I call the architecture of a book, the biblio, bibliographical architecture or the academic architecture, if you will, if it's an academic book. And really think through what your reading strategy is going to be. Read through different things that just sort of catch your interest to prime your mind. Prime your mind for what's there, but don't skip the actual reading the book. The other thing too I think that's really important is to read the conclusion first in many books because if the con and this is not true for all books but if the conclusion isn't profound enough to figure out how the author reached that conclusion maybe you can skip it and then read the introduction and see if the setup gives you some clues about where to read next so if you're not going to read the book from cover to cover which I still think is highly highly recommended for what it does to the memory connections you can experience. Uh, you can get a map of what parts of the book you might want to read first, and then read them. So chapters are designed with conclusions, or introductions and conclusions, and you, you'll miss out on a lot if you're just skimming. Now, there are distinctions to be made in the speed reading world between what kinds of speed reading are skimming and what kinds aren't. Um, and all of this relates to watching movies, by the way. You can speed, speed movie, watch, speed watch, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, I did that a lot when I was doing, preparing for my field exams, for my PhD. I had a VCR, or sorry, well, I had a VCR, but I had a DVD player that allowed me to fast forward while showing the subtitles on almost all the, the, the DVDs. So I watched them without sound which actually trained me to be a particular kind of film analyst. So I was looking for story structure and dialogue a lot more than I was some of the classic elements of film. And then so later when I became a film professor, I had to actually go and retrain a lot of my brain and read a lot about sound elements of cinema because it completely trained myself to not pay attention to it, even though sound is 95% of, of, the, of the movie experience. So that's, a, that's an interesting issue uh, of an of of an uh, uh, in and of itself
Nick says, loved it. Watch Robocop three times. Just try it again, please. All right, well, maybe if I have a film-watching friend to, <laughs> to, to keep me from being too fidgety while I sit through it, then that would be uh, an option. Hint, hint. Uh, Happy Brat says, do you ever really get involved with the directing of the stuff in your memory palaces, perhaps too much? I've made a couple I've not wanted to reuse because I enjoy the results so much. Well, I'd say that's a blessing, Happy Pratt, something to be happy about. And really enjoy that, that. I don't see a problem with that. But, you know, I think the, the distinction to be made here is that we are being a stage director rather than a film director. And why I say that is because a lot of people, they come across the idea that movies are like video recorders and you're recording everything that happens and then replaying it exactly as it happened. But that's not how memory works and it's not how memory techniques work, especially not memory techniques grounded in spatial memory or memory palaces. So what you're doing, you make your memory palace, like let's say for example the hair cutting scene from uh, Thor and wow what a great little contained area that is for just simply making well, I, I I call this I call this a, a like a like a dice place uh, the five on a dice right so you've got the four corners of that space and then you've got the actual chair where he's sitting to get the haircut and then of course you've got an amazing bridging figure which I'm not going to reveal for those of you who haven't seen Thor yet um, and uh, it's really really fascinating how fast and easy it is if you use the five dice principle for for those kind of really small contained areas in in film so really great really great um, how that all works but not directing it like a movie director but rather directing it like a stage play director so you've got your bridging figures you've got your characters but they don't replay exactly what they did the last time as they would in a movie when you just rewind and play that scene again the only thing that changes when you do that is your chemical your chemical being right chemical changes you're not the same chemical person that changes but the movie is more or less the same but when you do replay in a memory palace you not only have to get the actors back into position and say you know action but they themselves will not perform it exactly the same way twice so if you're getting pleasure out of revisiting them in that place, if you've taken Thor, for example, and now you're replaying it in your mind, you're not replaying a movie, you're replaying a stage play. And you're just getting those actors to replay whatever it is that you had them do to help you recall that information. And then if you don't have it accurate 100% the first time, compound in there elements in your magnetic imagery so that you do get... Uh, 100% accuracy. Now, the only catch I would say is that I would, in my practice, want to avoid getting so in love with replaying a memory palace that I forget what the proper, or what I would call the proper use of the memory palace is, which is get it into long-term memory and be done with it. You know, go on to memorizing more stuff, making more connections, or reusing it in a way that is not reusing it for the pleasure in and of itself, but reusing it to learn and remember more information with 100% accuracy so that's compounding and if that's a pleasure great and it, you know basically if you're getting pleasure out of that fine amazing just just do it but think about how you could actually get pleasure and get more learned as a result so anytime that you can reuse memory palaces in a way that is adding more information with those high level of accuracy uh, high levels of accuracy, all the better. Uh, that's That to me seems to be the most important important thing to focus on. Um, Nick, back to elevator music, something being repetitive, rather put something more diverse so you can create a memory palace. Yeah, okay, uh, that, well that, I mean that is an interesting question. Diversity in music, again, depends on what it's, what it's supporting and so forth. Um, it's an interesting topic to, to think more about and do tests with. I know Jonathan and I, Jonathan Levy, um, of Super Learner, we did a survey and we asked about putting music in the background of some of our video courses that we're working on together now. And when the overwhelming majority, we're talking 95% of people were like, no way, do not put music in the background. 
at, at most, and we, we had hundreds of responses to this, at most, put some sound effects, but no, no, no. Uh, and I, I, I said that I predicted that that would be the outcome because it's just too distracting. But it depends on what it is that you're trying to convey. So in guided meditations, for example, yeah, some background stuff will be there. Movies, of course, there's a huge power in silence, but that power is balanced and strengthened and taken away by how it's placed in the context of sound and music. And it's a whole art in and of itself and a very, very powerful one, well worth learning more about how it works technologically and how it works aesthetically, how it works psychologically, and so on. Happy Pratt says, I mean, I really enjoy the journey and the images as well as what they signify. And you say you like the distinction between film director and stage director. Opens it up well to edit or make additions if you need to. Yeah, I think it's one of the most fundamental things. I get many, many emails about, you know, so I'm just making a movie in my mind. No, you're, you're staging a play. And that is a very, very powerful and empowering distinction. And it explains why you get variations and why those variations are actually a power and what to do if they are in any way disempowering because that is going to enable you to have a much, much more profound, powerful and accurate experience. By the way, if you're hopping on this call, hit that thumbs up button. Let me know where you are in the world and what you're doing, what you're thinking. If you're not subscribed to this channel, hit that subscribe button so we can meet more often like this. It's a, a pinball world out there. You never know when the stars are going to align, the time zones are going to meet. We'd love to meet with you here on the Magnetic Memory Live YouTube stream when we have them. Mr. Strong, Hammer, bam! Get some memory stuff happening. Um, so yeah, there's I mentioned one, and that's my sort of mid-movie mid memory palace in Thor. But the opening scene is itself a powerful, powerful memory palace r right there. And so that's not the five dice technique there because it's not, it's not a square space. So in that case, you kind of want to think of what are the core elements in the scene and what can be more or less fixed where you don't have to think about the fixity. It's just obvious. There's, no, there's just a logical linear line. And so that logical linear line in that scene, and I don't want to give it away for people who haven't seen the movie yet, see the movie. It's a powerful memory tool for you. It'll help you make connections, like the memory connection will help you do, which uh, if you don't have this, we've been sending this all over the place, and uh, it's really great. You can grab a copy at magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash connect, and uh, we will send it out to you. Um, so. The most logical thing in that scene is to have a straight line with three stations. Whoa, wait a second, not a pen, a hammer. <laughs> so if we think of a straight line, we've got a very natural number, so to speak. It's not really a natural number, I guess, but a number that instantly comes to mind to make it super, super easy to remember is the number three. Because there's a beginning and a middle and an end. Or maybe it's a beginning and a middle and an end. But it's certainly not a beginning, middle, or an end. It's uh, definitely starting here and going there, or there and here. But I'm not meaning to say, well, actually, you could use the hammer also as like a little mini miniature memory palace and think, OK, so we've got three stations on there. That's, that's it maybe a bit more advanced, but you can do it. And uh, it does work. And there's uh, some interesting things in the magnetic memory method training that, that goes deeper into that because there's a lot of ways that you can really dial your technique down to using things that way. But uh, basically, if you think of that scene, there's Thor. He's sort of in a central position. And then there's this flaming bad guy dude who is over here. And then there's the absence of Thor's hammer, which has yet to arrive, and the directionality from which it will come to where he is in the scene and to which it will essentially go. So those are three magnetic stations. Very, very simple. Nothing, nothing that you're, you know, you're going to use to memorize massive amounts of information, but you're at a party, you meet a couple of people, boom, where the hammer, the direction from which the hammer comes, where Thor is, 
and his enemy. Boom, boom, boom. And you can just use those as pegs, people might call them, hooks, or magnetic stations as I prefer to call them, because you've now created, in effect, a memory palace of the scene. But what you want to do is you actually want to go back after the movie, play in your mind, in your spatial memory, the space that you've never been to, but you have been to, strangely enough, and in whatever way works for you, use your full tools of mental cognition to um, explore that, to experience it, in whatever way that you experience it. If you don't see pictures in your mind, what is going on in your mind? Think of that. Everybody has spatial cognition. It's, I can't think of how anybody wouldn't outside of brain damage or not having a brain. There's some there. There's some measure of extraordinary and powerful spatial conception that we all have, that you have, right now, that you could start using this. Happy Pratt asks, can you just use characters as memory palaces? Like get them to do or say something. Oh, you just answered it. Pegs in place of palaces. Yeah, you can do all kinds of things. I mean, characters are, are, are very powerful tools. Um, in, in the November edition of the Magnetic Memory Method newsletter, we talked about how to use characters in a very, very powerful way. And there's still time to actually get that. If you go to magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash connect, you could still get the November newsletter. And uh, I'd be delighted if you did. Uh, wow, it's a, it's, a, it's a lot of fun putting that together for you all. And there's a very, very special training about that. And it's all about amplifying the amount of tools that you have in small spaces so you have more to play with and characters is a part of that. It's something you've just got to get in there and use and experiment with. And some people I know, they really, really do well with these small granular details, like fingers even, they get that detailed. Other people, it's just too compressed. It's, it's, not, it's not happening for them. So you've got to go bigger. So this is the difference between a, a macro magnetic station and a micro magnetic station. You're better off if you explore and learn how to use them both, but you'll find your preferences. We all find our style, our, our mnemonic style, through the practice of mnemonics. And if we're not in there using them, then we never get to unlock any of these options for ourselves, which is tremendously sad because there's so much to be gained from accessing these parts of your mind. They're a free resource. They're just sitting there waiting to be tapped. It's like a cow that isn't being milked. I know it's kind of a terrible image, but if you don't grab it and squeeze that resource that you have, you get nothing out of it, and that's tremendously sad. Um, so really, uh, really powerful, powerful to get in there and do it. And there's no failure, you know? The only failure is to not give it a serious try. Set aside some time to learn memory techniques, to create the memory palaces, learn the other tools, the associated tools that can be used inside of memory palaces, and then go from there. There's really no end to this art. And you know, the ancients, they would have loved movies as memory tools in the way that we're talking about today. They would have loved it. They would have been all over it, like, like mustard on hot dogs. They would have just loved it. They'd, they'd, eat, they'd eat that stuff for breakfast because it's such powerful tools for if you're giving a speech, you know, and you think, okay, so I got three memory palaces from Thor. What an impactful movie that was on me. Really burned these places in my mind because I took the time not only to really be impressed by them, but then rehearse them later. Think about my strategy for using them. Now, if I'm gonna go give a simple speech and I know that my first station in Thor has three magnetic stations, I know that my second one has five, that's the haircut scene, and yeah, you know what? There's actually, I could use, I could, I could see using four because there's also the Hulk's quarters where he sleeps. That's a little bit more of a complex space than, than I would normally gravitate to, but if you actually, yeah, there's actually two, two quadrants to it that are actually nicely divided. 
so there you go. Uh, and so I'd call that eight stations. Yep. And then there's the last, the last scene, which would be three. So now I can think, look at how many stations I've got there. I've got a speech that has three, five plus eight. So we're looking at now 16. And then there's three in the end. So we've got 19 stations. You know, we could squeeze in another one if we needed to. But that's an entire speech that could be encoded inside of a movie. It's so fantastic. But you don't really get there to that level if you don't know the basics, if you don't know the foundation, and uh, make the connections. And so, yeah, the training's there. It's available at magneticmemorymethod.com. If you'd like something to arrive at your door, this guide comes. And uh, it's a kind of a special special way that it comes. Uh, so check it out at the memory or uh, magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash connect and uh, you won't find any hammers over there but the hammer of memory is available. It's flying towards people now through the air. Making more Mr. and Mrs. Strongs in their minds and their memory lives through the application of these techniques. It's not just you know data for later. It's people absolutely taking the steps, putting it into action, and uh, you know if you're taking a real estate course or you're, you're taking whatever it might be in the world, biology, chemistry, people ask about chemistry a lot, um, yeah, it's, uh, and it applies to anything. I haven't seen anything yet to which these tools do not have an application. Okay, so now, in talking to you, I've realized there's four memory palaces from the latest Thor movie. Excellent. <laughs> Very excited about that. And that's one of the things that happens, too, is if you put these techniques into use, you start talking about them, start processing them through your own practice and so forth, then you begin to actually make the discoveries that are next level, next level, next level, next level, and you find that this, 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 this rabbit hole really does go very deep. I don't think there's any end to it. And you see why people become students of this for life. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's just an enrapturing art, a mental craft, a mental skill. And it's beautiful because it combines skill and artistry and craftsmanship and, and science, and it's amazing. It's amazing the depths to which it can go. The only sadness I have is a lot of people like to think about it more than they like to use it, but I guess that's true of uh, a lot of things in life, and there's nothing wrong with that, because you may be urging yourself towards finally taking action and learning and using these techniques. I have some of the most amazing elder citizens, I'm not sure what the politically correct term is anymore, but let's just say people who are of stature in age, and they just get the most amazing results out of this. Right now, actually, we're doing a dream recall intensive, and it's just amazing. It's amazing. People who have never, ever remembered their dreams are experiencing near daily recall and just being blown away by what happens. It's, it's, there's something deeply edifying about connecting with your memory and having, like I had the other day, wow, it's just dream blossoming into experience. So I'd done my normal dream recall practice, and I knew that I'd missed something, but I couldn't quite catch what it was. But thanks to regular dream recall practice, it just blossomed into existence later in the day. I just, it's, it's like being transported into another world. And oh man, the emotions and the memories that you then draw from association. And I'm not talking about woo woo, la di da, blah 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 sort of dream analysis stuff yeah there's some value to playing around with that I'm talking about memory connection and developing deeper and deeper understanding of how your mind works and processes and constantly mining your memory for more memory tools experiences that you've forgotten memory palaces that you could be using but are lost to the sands of time and lost to forgetfulness lost to general lack of awareness and amnesia about who you are and where you've been and what you felt and how you can use all those tools anytime if you just have access to them and dream recall is a great way of having access to them in the same way that movie recall is a great way of having more access to how your brain works why it works how it works and just enjoying a much deeper connection with yourself it's powerful so just as you would passively 
or a passive memory exercise for just recalling movies as much as you can, playing them forward and backward in a linear sense. How many scenes can you reconstruct? You can do this with your dreams and then just start mining it. It's like Bitcoin, you know? <laughs> You're mining for another coin and the payoff is extraordinary. And yeah, you know, the, the spikes come and go and so forth, but it just keeps going up and up and up in value. And it, it, it's not an ego thing. It's not like you somehow are gonna become more egotistical the more you know about yourself. You're going to become more connected with yourself and connected with the things to which you are connected, which actually manages the ego and depletes the ego or puts it in perspective because you see just how interrelated everything is to the point that it's all connection. It's a very seductive experience. And once you're in, you're in. It's, you just sort of never get out of it. I remember talking to Harry Lorraine on the phone years ago now and him saying, you know, there's something deeply, deeply chemically, he didn't use the word chemically, but like just to the point of altering your biology when you first discover these what, what really can only be called miracles of memory. It is such a miraculous thing to explore and connect with your memory at a deeper level when you haven't had those connections before. It's extraordinary. It's extraordinary what happens to people. And now with the new Dream Recall Intensive program, watching it unfold, it's monumental. And then of course, when you're participating with other Dream Recall people, what ends up happening is you you, you, you share this experience. With, it's, it's almost like Inception or something. <laughs> it's kind of wild. Has anybody seen Inception? Let me know in the comments uh, if you're on the replay. Say Inception in the comments below or let me know if you've seen it now. It kind of has that Inception feel to it. But again, like the point is, is really just to create more memory tools for yourself to get more acquainted with your own past so that you have more mnemonic tools. It really seems that the the difference between people who are very good with memory techniques, ranging just from personal practice for knowledge, for, for personal learning, um, to competition level things, is that they're just much more connected with their imagination, with their own memory as a tool in and of itself. And that's because they're able to access what they already know. None of this requires really knowing a whole bunch of stuff that you don't know. Um, it's actually the opposite. You're using what you already know, figuring out more about how that you know it and why that you know it, and getting a more sense of the connections intertwining all of this. I call this rhizomatic knowledge because rhizomatic knowledge has this, it's not a tree where the leaves are up here all going through a central um, trunk with then the, the roots going out willy-nilly. That's a, that's, a, that's a nice one, but it's not nearly as powerful as the rhizome, which has all these networks that are diagonal and linear, or sorry, um, uh, horizontal and, and vertical at the same time with all the diagonals, and they can just spontaneously pop up without any real connection, but they are connected. It's super, super powerful. It's much more powerful than the tree structure of knowledge. Rhizomatic knowledge is, is great. And, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, pulling that out of out of nowhere. This is this was a foundational, fundamental aspect of of uh, Deleuze and his his uh, his theory of assemblage. And he talked a lot about cinema, actually, the movies. And if you haven't read Cinema One and Cinema Two, it's pretty tough going. But I have some videos on another YouTube channel I have for film studies, and uh, I uh, talk about understanding Deleuze a little bit better because he's very, very powerful. But basically, in a nutshell, what his argument of assemblage is and how it connects to rhizomatic knowledge is that we are actually physically connected to, say, the cinema and the apparatus. So our bodies assemble with it. If you think about you know, a bicycle and then your body, when you get on the bike, you assemble with it for a period of time. You actually become part of the machine. You're the driver of the machine, but you cannot drive the machine without the machine assembling with you at some level. It, this doesn't mean that it has consciousness or agency or anything like that. It's just the idea that you're assembled. You become part of an assemblage. Well, it's the same thing with, with uh, going to the movies. So you go and you sit in the theater or your home theater, 
and you're actually assembled then whatever is projecting the movie onto the screen either from behind you or from a TV signal or whatever it is there are actually photons of light that are being triggered to fly through the air that then physically touch your brain and you assemble with this it's all physical and the air between you is not empty it's filled with with all kinds of matter so the, it's a transference of matter it's physical to physical there's no emptiness in between it although you know there you can also get into how everything is empty and blah 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 but really his point is to think about all of this assemblage and it's just a powerful way of thinking about how and why this triggers new memories for you it's because you're physically assembled with it it's causing chemical things to happen in your brain because it's actual it's actual energy actual something substance that's traveling triggering your eyes that then goes through the occipital uh, lobe and all that stuff all you know your parietal lobe and and all these other lobes that get involved in there and blossoms forth chemical experience and we know that our memories are chemically encoded in locations in our brain we know that our memories actually move chemically from different parts of our brain as they age and this is a physical process it's in the material world it's in reality and so this this blossoming forward of ideas that are rhizomes as opposed to a tree structure they don't need to be connected or we don't need to see the actual physical connection because they're happening inside the brain which is all physically connected anyway so that's why it pops up it's connected without being connected and the more these deep realizations come the more that you experience the spontaneous eruption and when you're using memory techniques these images that are just perfect for doing the encoding and the speed with which they come they emerge they pop up because not that there's a top-down tree structure but because it is rhizomatic it's every direction all directions and the more you use this the faster it becomes the more solid it you experience it the more plump it is so to speak the more turgor pressure it has if you were to think of the world of plants so you're watering some plants and uh, you can see the leaves filling up and they get more rigid it's because they have turgor, turgor pressure and that helps with photosynthesis it all works better it's the same thing with knowledge you read books you keep reading books you keep feeding your trigger pressure your ability to make connections to experience connections to have images on the fly it all connects relative to your feeder system and that's what this is designed to do is to give you constant nourishment so that your connections keep growing and growing and growing so if you haven't looked at this, please do. Go to magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash connect. You will enjoy it. I will give you the hammer of the gods <laughs> and help you become Mr. or Mrs. Strong or whatever, uh, whatever you would like to be called uh, before Strong. Very, very enjoyable. So let's check in with our comments here. I see a bunch coming in. Uh, Nick says music tastes are too diverse hard to please everyone with sound one soundtrack. That's very true um, Although I would say that when it comes to movies Yeah, yeah people do complain about the wrong song at the wrong moment. It's true Happy Pratt says can you just use characters as memory palaces? Oh, yeah, we, we covered that um, How would you recommend using make-believe palaces like you've spoken about over real-life outside spaces? Uh, well, first of all, I would always recommend that people start with buildings, with buildings that they're familiar with, learn the foundations, then go to outdoor locations. Some people do really well with outdoor locations uh, from the, from the get-go. I don't find that that's the majority, though. I think that if you're struggling, if you're having any issues, make sure that you go back to the, to the basics. There's a reason the ancients talked about using the inside of buildings and not the outside of buildings. That has a lot to do with how spatial memory works. They weren't aware of the memory science back then, but we know, you know, just, I was watching Christopher Hitchens the other day and he was demonstrating just how much people knew about the atomic theory of, rea of nature before they had the scientific tools to figure it out. Well, same thing with the memory art and science, is that they knew that our spatial memory just responds a lot better to contained spaces. And they thought a lot in the ancient literature, if you go to 
take the time to read it about the distance between your stations and how that affects the so to speak magnetism of them and one of the problems that beginners have with outdoor memory palaces is they make those stations way too distant from one another and that sets stacks everything against you and the problem with outdoor locations is that you don't have as many options for fixed intervals so to speak and that's really important to mastering this skill so when I was first using these things for my dissertation, it didn't, didn't cause a huge problem, but one of my memory palaces had miles between <laughs> some of the stations. Luckily, the strength of the bridging figure that I used in there was sufficient to and my familiarity with the, those places that I chose was sufficiently strong enough to not make it a big issue, but uh, I certainly wouldn't do it the same way again uh, because it's, it really is it causes a blip and those blips are just not necessary anything that you can remove in terms of cognitive requirement cognitive drain get rid of it in your practice you'll, you'll have a much more satisfying experience you talked about in your contributions that pleasure and satisfaction that you can have focus on that focus on that and, and think about the distance between stations now I don't think that that doesn't mean you shouldn't have memory palaces with distance between stations there's a place for everything and it, it, the more that you experience, the better your practice is going to become. Because this could be, to be fair, completely and counterintuitively different for you. But no one's going to know unless you're the memory astronaut who goes out into these diverse spaces and gives it a try for yourself. Uh, but the more you do it based on strong foundations, the, the better it's going to be for you. So I hope that answers the question. And. Uh, you know what you said about a memory you couldn't grasp just randomly blossoming later on? Is that just relaxing and calming the water, so to speak, so the memory is finally retrievable for your subconscious? Relaxation has a lot to do with being a good nemonist. Being a, a powerful, profound nemonist has so much to do with, with this whole puzzle. So the, one of the number one recommendations when people are struggling is to make sure that you are adding relaxation to your practice. It's, it's all, almost always the source of struggle is that your brain is not relaxed, your body is not relaxed, and your brain and your body go together. Uh, they really, really do. And it's so powerful and empowering to take care of that, to take care of relaxation if you're struggling. Make sure that you know the basics, that your practice is properly grounded in real training and you've done the exercises of the training, which is so simple. It's not like military boot camp here. Really, the maximum time investment anyone should be making in, in addition to, you know, a couple of hours of watching some videos and inside of that doing the actual things that are recommended, you'll, you'll be set up and ready to go. So this is, not, this, is, this, is, this is not rocket science. And then you want to drill deeper into how all this applies to your particular area of interest. So if it's language learning, uh, then there's going to be specific things you can do to make that language learning goal different than, say, things that are with passwords or chemical equations or things that might involve unusual characters like in chemistry or math and so forth and that's different than speeches Bible verses for example there are different demands different different angles different ways of approaching those things and you can do training for that but relaxation is is fundamental to success with these techniques and so if you don't have relaxation then you're not going to you're not going to experience it as well as as you could and of course the cool thing is is it's a it's a self a self enforcing and reinforcing circle because the more confident you get with the memory techniques the more relaxed you you begin to feel and the more relaxed you are the more confident you become because you use them better so really really interesting how that that works uh, Happy Pratt's asking, can you recommend some relaxation tips if you're on the spot trying to remember something? Breathing exercises. 
Well, yeah, sure. The, the, the first thing is to recognize that you're not relaxed and then make the commitment to relax. So, you know, when I go to watch a movie, I love to do, a, and I want to remember more of the movie, I love to do progressive muscle relaxation. And that's just as simple as doing a kind of body scan. You're sitting there in the movie theater. You know you want to use it as a memory palace. You know you want to get multiple memory palaces out of it. You want to remember the names of characters, locations, so that you have not only memory exercise, but more memory tools later on. Well, what you do is you do a little bit of progressive muscle relaxation. So squeeze your fists, let them go. Um, squeeze all your major muscles. You can start from your feet, go up through your your calves and then your thighs and yes I'm going to use the word buttocks you can squeeze your buttocks squeeze your stomach muscles squeeze your chest again your fists do extensions like that and you all right I'm already feeling more relaxed just doing it now if you really want to get into it you can relax all the muscles of your jaw and your tongue so you know that must look pretty <laughs> on YouTube. <laughs> but uh, you can do things with your tongue to relax your tongue. Um, oh, hell, why not? I'll show you. Like this. Try this next time you want to relax. You can do that like 10 times in both ways. Do it inside too. Oh, man, that feels so good. And, you know, I, you could do this in the movie theater. No one's paying attention to you. No one's looking at you. Wait until the lights go down and so forth. You can even be like this. Maybe it looks kind of weird if someone's looking at you, but who cares, right? You're relaxing yourself. And the more you actually relax your jaw, and, 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 and if, you, um, if, you, if you try to cultivate a state where you're letting your tongue float free in your mouth and not touch the surface of your mouth, this tends to, I wouldn't say it's universally true all the time, but it tends to stop so much thinking. There seems to be a relationship between having your tongue touch parts of your mouth and thinking. So experiment with that. See if it works. Anyway, there's more you can do with your tongue. Mm, uh, mm, uh. If you're really practiced with your tongue, you can do this. <laughs> I love that one. And uh, yeah, there's more, more. Um, get your whole face really, really relaxed. You'll enjoy everything in life so much more when you do that. And you know, it's something you can't overdo. Uh, by the way, I learned this uh, from learning how to sing to make sure all this stuff up here is relaxed. And for before going on a podcast or before going on YouTube Live or so forth, relaxing all of that just it, it helps everything. It helps everything flow because you you are relaxed. So you can't overdo it. Um, and there's more, more and more and more and more breathing wise. There's oodles and oodles of of breathing routines and exercises and so forth a lot of it comes down to just paying attention to the breath and breathing while you're watching a movie is a great way to stay connected with, with the present and so give that a try just look up breathing exercises there's a, a billion of them um, a quick one is to uh, count five in and five out and you can hold for five seconds while you're while you're in there, or you can just go five in, five out. Um, and yes, you can pay attention to a movie while you're counting. You don't actually have to count in your mind. You can count with your fingers on your leg. Just tap like that, uh, or press, and track that, and you'll feel more relaxed. You, 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 you may forget that that's what you're doing, and come back, and fade in, and fade out, and so forth. But those are, those are on, the, on the fly relaxation exercises. And if you do this enough, you can then just realize that you're not feeling relaxed and then ask yourself to be relaxed. Ask yourself to be relaxed and because you have conditioned yourself to be relaxed, then you're going to find that you'll be more relaxed as a result of just training yourself to be relaxed and it'll just, you'll just fall into relaxation on request on demand so to speak uh, whenever you want and I love to do this while watching movies and and be free you know my poor wife she hates how I laugh out loud freely in movies but it's 
funny stuff, and it's well worth laughing, and uh, I enjoy it, so be free, and you'll remember more. You'll remember the jokes more if you allow yourself to laugh. Uh, there's also good scientific research that if you want to relax, yawn. Even if you don't feel like you need to yawn, you can just yawn. Go through the action of yawning <sighs> and do it multiple times. And this, oh, feels so good. <laughs> I didn't have to yawn, but I did yawn and it almost became a real yawn. And this creates a relaxation. So fake yawning can uh, really, really help your memory loosen up and relax. Um, when I watch movies, though, I do tend to fall asleep at the theater, so I don't practice fake yawning at the theater because I do want to stay awake. But falling asleep at movies actually is one of one of my favorite pleasures. And like we were talking about earlier, if you miss this, go go check out the replay. You can get a lot out of movies just by or lectures that you attend just by letting it go. It's recorded. It's there. So. Pratt says, I learned to flip my tongue over to the left and right on a car journey with the visor mirror. By the time I arrived, I could do it. Little goals. You learn all sorts of useless things. The difference is, though, is that this is not a useless thing. It's a very, very powerful thing. And congrats on learning how to do that. You can actually use it as part of creating greater relaxation, which will serve your memory. It'll serve your memory in so many ways if you put it in a chain of of relaxation inducing activities that uh, enable you to to um, to have greater relaxation and it just gets better and better and better and it's all part of connecting with your memory better so there's the memory connection I highly recommend it to all the people who want to learn more about these matters that's at magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash connect I see Dequa has here hello great to see you um, I think that, uh, I don't know if I pronounced your screen name properly, but I, I really always uh, appreciate seeing you, and thanks for saying hello. Um, so, to recap all of this, and if there are more questions, pop them in there. Uh, it, uh, it's very powerful to make memory palaces from movies, and you will have an extraordinary experience doing it if you just dive in and do it. And there is, I'm going to post on the replay a link below, but there is a detailed post on magneticmerrymyth.com in a podcast that goes into using not just movies but series in more detail. Uh, Breaking Bad is a really good one to use, and uh, why has to do with how that there are some very, very stable locations. And you get multiple exposure to them. And so you can really, really think of how you're going to, to use them and then, when you're using them, revisit them again and again and again. Uh, there's a funny video on, the, on that as well. So look for the replay of this and the link below. And uh, if you're watching the replay now and you haven't hit thumbs up, do so. If you're not subscribed to this channel, please do subscribe. And if you care about memory education, get involved. Come visit me at magneticmemorymethod.com and if you'd like to connect at a deeper level, then go to magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash connect for the memory connection. And you are in time for the November newsletter. December is being written as we speak and I really, really uh, am excited about the next one. It touches on some of the things that we've talked about today and uh, touches on some of the things that we talked about in the November issue, which is really interesting because it relates to movies but is very different at the same time. A different technique to reach the same outcome and what's the outcome that we want? Well we want 100% accurate recall so we can look at one piece of information or two pieces of information or three pieces of information or 51 pieces of information because I gave away one of these cards and uh, the absolute absolute accuracy you can experience is astonishing because it doesn't have to be 51 cards from a deck it can be 51 new words from a language you're studying and then you can add phrases to those words that you may not already know and 
the compound value is extraordinary because the phrases that you'll use will use the words that you already memorized. So the actual amount of memory palaces that you need goes down and the amount of, uh, of activity that you wind up doing goes down over time because you have more to play with. And we talked on this call, if you missed it, about how to stage the play that you're playing with and how to get more out of it and compound it and how to use movies so that that uh, amount of time that you spent watching the movie and the the dollar value of what you spent at the movie it multiplies over and over and over again time after time after time as it becomes part of your memory connection your your universe in your mind of how you experience everything that is in your mind so that's the memory connection which uh, I'm really really excited to get out to you and uh, excited to get out to all the people who are part of this world and you know if you want the dream recall intensive that's going on and you're eligible for it once that I know you have the connection so magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash connect for the memory connection thank you everybody for that was a really great session lots of wonderful questions and if you are catching the replay go ahead and uh, leave a comment below with your question and we can pick it up at a different time Thanks again. Till we have a chance to speak again, visit me at magneticmerrymethod.com and keep yourself magnetic. And let me know what movies you're going to watch soon and use as a memory palace. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.